This is episode 244 of the Stem Cell Podcast, The Mammalian Lung, with Dr. Emma Rollins. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, please rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Emma Rollins from the University of Cambridge. She's on the podcast to talk about her research studying lung development and maintenance with the long-term aim of inducing regeneration in people with diseased lungs. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, it's time. The ICCR 2023 annual meeting starts tomorrow in Boston, Massachusetts. By the time this episode airs, Dale and I and the whole Stem Cell podcast team will be on the way to the meeting, and we're so excited to meet you all. Find us throughout the meeting at the Stem Cell podcast booth in the exhibit hall, or drop by the meetup hub on June 16th at 9.30 a.m. to meet the whole team. We'll see you there. Looking forward to that. Can't wait. Uh, Today on this roundup, we're starting with something a little bit different. You know, those matters arising things you see in nature. I think they're fun, a little bit of drama and science and uh, transparency with the drama. They really put it out front. This was about uh, direct reprogramming. You know, ever since your boy Deepak came on the scene with his direct reprogramming in the heart, a lot of groups went in on that. Um, And all the, 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 you know, I don't know, hype, but the enthusiasm maybe has faded a little bit. It's gone to the backdrop, but it's still going on. Direct reprogramming is still a really promising avenue toward therapeutic intervention with these a lot of these degenerative diseases. Um, and, you know, th- these stories keep coming out at a steady pace. This is one about uh, in vivo reprogramming of astrocytes into neurons, which, of course, you know, has tremendous promise. In this case, to treat Parkinson's disease, there was a story just about three years ago now from Hao Qian and Zhang Dongfu, uh, who were at UCSD at the time. Uh, this was a nature story called Reversing a Model of Parkinson's Disease with in situ converted nigral neurons. All right. Um, and, and this story was that uh, knockdown of PTBP1 in the cortex, striatum, and substantia nigra, the midbrain effectively programmed astrocytes into functional neurons that rescued, and this is the key, rescued motor defects in a mouse model of Parkinson's disease. But here, in a conflicting set of results that came from Than Huang and Don Juan Kim and Seth Blackshaw, who are all at Johns Hopkins University, they kind of refute those results. They show that by genetic disruption of PTBP1, also in combination with cell lineage analysis, there wasn't really a discernible astrocyte to neuron conversion uh, or substantial changes even in in the expression of PTBP1 uh, in astrocytes in that case. And what they conclude at the end is that these disparity in the results most likely reflect uh, leaky neuronal expression in these GFAP Cre mice uh, that uh, the original group used to label astro- astrocytes. And, you know, they really went hard here. They said that the study lacked several controls. Um, they didn't actually show that PTBP1 expression in astrocytes was reduced in vivo. Uh, they didn't uh, show lineage relationships directly. They were inferred using these GFAP-based constructs, um, which can be leaky. Uh, they didn't show... Uh, evidence of glia to neuron conversion with strict lineage analysis, this is what, which is what they used here, nor did they use uh, single cell RNA sequencing, which they also used in this Matters Arising paper. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, Drs. Huang, Kim, and Blackshaw, they use all those things. They do genetic lineage analysis, SCRNA-seq, um, in these uh, different targeted PTBP1 knockout. And, and they use a different uh, Cree mouse too. They use this ALD uh, 1L1 Cree ERT2 mice, um, which is also expressed in astrocytes uh, to induce this specific conversion. Um, and while they showed that there was a significant reduction in these PTBP1 positive astrocytes in the cortex striatum and substantia nigra, uh, none of those cells were co-labeled with neur- neuronal markers, suggesting that they weren't actually converted. Um, didn't induce a, a ty- tyrosine hydroxylase or dopaminergic transporter expression, which you would see. 
in neurons. Um, they're, they're the altered physiology that you would expect to see uh, was not observed. There was not a induction of neural-like electrophysiological properties. Then they performed uh, single cell RNA seq of the whole cortex striatum and so substantia nigra showed that there was indeed a reduction in astrocyte expression of PTBP1, but you know no conversion. So uh, by many measures, they show that it wasn't really there. Um, and then the comeback here, which was from Hao Qian and, and Zhang Dongfu again, who are at different places now, both back in China, um, but at different universities, uh, they they come back and pretty much say, first of all, they're like, your data is not very well analyzed either. They said that the there was not enough replicates in the scRNA seq. Um, also show that the cells were of compromised integrity, uh, and they sh uh, suggested also that there was in inefficient Cre expression um, to drive the PTBB1 ablation in the astrocytes. Uh, they say that ultimately. Um, while they acknowledge the disparity, what they they chalk it up to, uh, they are, they're not saying that anybody's wrong in this matters arising. What they're saying is is a failure in the tools or interpretation. And and what they cite is previous studies that have shown that if you have PTB knockout versus knockdown, you can get distinct phenotypes. And, and that's what they're saying is a plausible explanation between the the disparity in these two outcomes. Is that the different me methods used, either GFAP Cree versus that ALT uh, Cree ERT2 construct? They perhaps mediated uh, different degrees of PTBP1 knockdown, and that, as has been noted before, can result in, in variable phenotype there. So, I mean, kind of fighting it out in, in the public eye here. Um, ultimately, I, I would say that this is a bit of a hit on the story, which is really exciting to have NMOS conversion, you know, relatively straightforward approach. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I like these stories, Arun, because I think they really elevate the transparency. They get all these controversies really out there instead of on pub pier. Um, and they allow for a, a editorial uh, and peer reviewed response, um, which, you know, it can stop from some, you know, just ugly mudslinging. Arun, what do you think about these matters arising stories? Yeah, these are, you know, high profile, high profile drama. You could say that a little bit high profile drama in the morning. But I think it, it was, uh, you know, a little bit contentious, but you have to do these kind of things. And there's a matter of pride that comes up as well. You know, no one likes to be discredited or disproven in the discoveries that they make, especially in such a high profile journal, such as Nature. I mean, this brings me back to something that I actually saw tangentially when I was a graduate student, actually, when uh, Sean Wu, my former uh, lab mentor at Stanford, actually published a paper in Circulation Research that was showing uh, actually the direct title was inefficient reprogramming of fibroblasts to cardiomyocytes using the you know GATA4 GMT protocol, um, and this was actually um, addressing some of the work that Deepak Srivastava was doing. You mentioned <laughs> Deepak, I don't know if he's my boy, but he's one of the pioneers of direct cardiac reprogramming. And back then, the protocol uh, was pretty inefficient. It's improved over time, but Sean did something and the lab did something, uh, then publishing this pretty high profile paper in circulation research, which is one of the bigger profiles in cardiovascular medicine that is directly refuting what, uh, what, what Deepak put out. And that did cause a bit of contention between the labs and a bit of controversy as well, but that's what we have to do in science. You know, the hypotheses are disproven and, you know, ideally you want to have a technology that is reproducible and is able to be reproduced across multiple labs sort of, again, tangentially, another form of direct reprogramming that you can think of is IPS reprogramming, right? Producing induced pluripotent stem cells from somatic tissue. And I think one of the reasons why that technology exploded the way that it did is that that's a form of direct re reprogramming that is quite efficient and people have been able to replicate it in different labs across the world. And so not to say, you know, not to poo-poo direct reprogramming at all, and it definitely has improved over time, but I think uh, there are still certain technical hurdles and technical inefficiencies to to work out. In addition to things like you mentioned, like the leakiness of Cree um, and that sort of thing. I actually thought we even covered this paper a few years ago. But anyways, coming back full circle. So yeah, a little bit of a uh, little bit of drama in the morning. But you know, hey, that's that's what you got to do when pride is at stake, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. It's it's a matter of efficiency, and that can explain maybe some of these uh, disparate results. But um, you know, I just want to talk about these matters arising for a second because it, it's tough. I think it takes a lot of courage. I mean, it's it's kind of like a hit job that you're putting out. And as I think, particularly, I I, I know a researcher is a close friend of mine who was at the, at the beginning of his career, and it takes a lot of courage to go after a, a big deal result like this because you know. Trying to trying to publish a, a, a negative story, I think it, it doesn't make you know you very popular in the field. Um, you probably lose the support of a lot of you know zealots of of whatever you're attacking, um, and particularly in this case. I mean, I'm not saying that the the matters arising came out of a out of a, a young group, um, but still, I think it it takes a lot of courage, particularly in this case. Because if you look at the pub here, I mean, immediately after this story, there was a lot of rattle just because it was so efficient and robust and this NMOS should be easily reproducible. Everyone was going crazy. But here's the thing. There was a, another parallel paper that came out just around the same time that also supported this result. So the idea that, you know, you know, once is never, twice is always. So having two stories there, I think, created a lot of momentum for this result and to come after it, I think, took one courage, but more than that, it took trying to reproduce it and finding that, hey, it wasn't working. And I think that's really the beauty of science is that if you go out there for, for results not, or a method's not robust enough, then, you know, you got to hold it to the fire and, and, and tune it up until it can be useful and, and, and actually, you know, uh, be disseminated and applied. So I, I like the, the, I admire uh, the investigators on both sides here for for hashing this out, and and that's what we need to move forward. Yeah, and the thought is perhaps this is something that should happen more often, and it I think it is something that happens should that more often. But the reality is, like you said, people don't like to publish negative data, and more than that, people don't like to you know fight each other. Typically, in such a high profile public setting, like in a Nature editorial. That's not something that's that's commonly done. So we'll stay tuned with the story and see where it goes. But we'll stay in the realm of you know neurodegenerative diseases as well. This is a cell stem cell paper and really kind of a, a milestone that I'm going to talk about here. Um, it's a phase one to a clinical trial in ALS with rapinirol, a drug candidate that was actually identified by IPS drug discovery. I was actually at this uh, a meeting recently with the local leaders in stem cell biology here in the LA basin in Greater Los Angeles. Sheila Chari was actually there as well, editor in chief of Cell Stem Cell, and she was actually talking about this paper quite a bit during one of her presentations. You know, indicating that it was a bit of a milestone paper because you know it's a uh, it's something the drug that's actually identified through iPS screening and screening of iPS derived neuronal cells that's progressed to an early phase clinical trial, and this is one of a few papers that have come out recently in the area of neurodegeneration that have taken this, this paradigm forward. So we can dive right into it. This is coming from the lab of uh, Hideyuki Okano and the uh, ALS trials, clinical trials consortium. So there's this drug, rapinirol, which was identified through IPS screening and tested for efficacy and safety in ALS. Uh, this is, you know, building off work that was previously published. So this IPS-based drug discovery has led to this phase 1-2A trial of rapinirol in ALS. And this is the, some of the results from that early phase clinical trial. One of the big caveats, and I'll go ahead and say this, is that this was not a very high-powered study. This is, uh, you know, 20 participants with sporadic ALS actually received rapinirol or the placebo for 24 weeks in this double-blind period to actually figure out what the safety, tolerability, and, you know, efficacy of the therapeutic effects are, right? So this is phase one, two clinical trials, so you got to figure out safety first and foremost. Um, they analyzed the, the patient's muscle strength over the course of actually receiving this particular drug, rapinirol, um, monitored their daily activity. The decline in this ALS FRSR, which is actually a way to assess the functional status of ALS um, uh, patients, was actually not that different in the placebo group uh, when you're comparing the placebo group and the group that's actually receiving the rapinirol. But in what they did here is actually extended the trial a bit through this open label extension period. Uh, when they extended it out further, the rapinirol actually group actually showed a significant suppression of that ALS dec decline. So I think that was the key here. They had to extend out the trial a bit more to see some of the results, uh, some of the improvement in phenotype. 
And they actually showed in, in their quantitative analysis here that there was an additional 28 weeks of disease progression free survival. And that's, you may not think that's much. And when it comes to the long term progression of ALS, but there are not that many therapies for this disease. And it's just so sad when someone is diagnosed with it. So, like, I think there's only two or three clinically approved, FDA approved therapies out there for, for ALS. So, I think anything that's in that quiver, uh, you know, it's it's a good thing. And they dove into a little bit more mechanistically, actually showed that IPS derived motor neurons from the participants uh, showed a, a dopamine D2 receptor expression and a potential involvement of a particular cholesterol pathway in mediating the therapeutic effects. So that's kind of cool. And perhaps that's why it was, you know, elevated to a cell stem cell paper, because they took a little bit of a, a mechanistic deep dive into it. And going a little bit more into it, they showed that lipid peroxide uh, represents a potential surrogate clinical biomarker to assess how ALS is progressing and the overall efficacy of the drug. But like I mentioned, and they straight up say this very early on in the paper, because this was by far their biggest criticism of this clinical trial, is that this is a small sample size. And there's a high attrition rate in this open label extension period. So there's definitely a lot more validation that has to occur to see whether this repinerol is 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 really doing what it's supposed to do. But, you know, initial proof of concept, initial early phase trial. And again, these are happening more often these days when it comes to identifying a drug from IPS screening and bringing into clinical trials. So like I said, this is a milestone and I'm sure there's going to be more papers like this coming out soon. Yeah, major milestone, major milestone in my view, major. You know, it's enough to have a, a clinical trial of, of iPS-derived cells uh, or, or a therapy derived from iPS screening. I think that's a big deal in terms of realizing the promise um, of iPS disease modeling, but also to add in the mechanism there and, and a little bit of diagnostics for a cherry on top. I mean, this is a, a complete story um, and as you said, I think representative of a lot of stories like like this one. We're breaking through, you know, my guy, Justin Achita, USC, he had that, you know, double feature a little while back in cell and cell stem cell. It was very similar modeling, getting, you know, candidate therapeutics. And I, I, I think we're really in the midst of this transformative time. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. Any kind of drug trials and, as you said, the limitations of small numbers, we're going to have to build this up and power it up a, a bit. but. You know, this is a part of this wave that I think we're in the middle of that's so exciting. And it's not just cell therapy, as this illustrates. It's it's all the other stuff, right? It's it's the, the traditional, more pharmacologic, but with new candidates and with more refined approaches. Uh, I think that, you know, we're, we're, we got so many, uh, to use your metaphor there, we got so many arrows in the quiver nowadays. It's hard not to, to be optimistic about the future for all these devastating diseases. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's it's amazing to see just 15 years after the discovery of iPSCs, we're actually using these cells, not just for clinical trials themselves and the cell therapy side of things, but also using them to identify preclinical drug candidates that you can progress to clinical trials. It's you know, the evolution of the field has been pretty astounding. And I think this is something that's going to be reflected at ISSCR. There's going to be a lot of emphasis on clinical translation at this meeting. I mean, talking to Sheila Chari as well, you know, at that uh, local LA area stem cell meeting, this is a major emphasis of cell stem cell these days is these translational studies. So you see more and more of them popping up. Yeah. So exciting. I mean, we may cure every, every disease out there. But I'll tell you what we will never do, Arun, is we'll never figure out the hematopoietic stem cell. I mean, I've given up and I think we all <laughs> ought to just throw in the towel because it's such a tough problem. And people have been, you know, trying to crack it for as long as they've been doing anything. Um, but what we have learned, you know, there's these three waves, right? The primitive, this uh, erythromyeloid progenitor wave, and then, of course, the definitive wave, uh, which occurs in the aorta gonadum mes mesonephros or AGM region around embryonic 10 point, embryonic day 10.5 in the mouse. Um, and that starts with the specification of hemogenic endothelial cells, all right? And those endothelial cells then undergo a transition to hematopoietic cell by uh, something called endothelial to hematopoietic transition. Uh, and that's how you get hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And as I said, people have been studying this process forever. Um, and these many studies, numerous studies, have identified a lot of the critical signaling transcriptional pathways that regulate 
hemogenic EC specification, also uh, hematopoietic stem cell generation, propagation, self-renewal. Some of those retinoic acid, KIT, NOTCH, P27, TGF-beta, uh, RUNX1, GATA2, a lot of factors. Uh, there's a very, very long list. But uh, the, the molecular interplay amongst these factors, and more importantly for, for the purpose of this paper, negative regulators of uh, hemogenic endothelial cell development and um, generation of hematopoietic stem cells is not really well sketched out. Uh, and a candidate there for a negative regulator is microRNAs, all right? We all know microRNAs, these short non-coding RNAs um, that post-transcriptionally repress their complementary mRNA targets. And not just, you know, a single target, they have this, they can have this kind of mass effect where a single microRNA can target many or a suite of different micro uh, mRNA. <clears throat> and depending on the cell type, and which uh, messenger RNAs are present, the same microRNA can have a dramatically different effect, right? Um, and microRNAs have been well studied in hematopoiesis. There's a lot that are known to be involved and play important roles in hematopoietic stem progenitor cell self-renewal, uh, maintenance, differentiation. But uh, the action of microRNAs in hemogenic endothelial cell specification or their transition to metapoietic stem cells, it's really not well understood, okay? And when you have something that's not well understood in hematopoiesis, who do you call Karen Hershey, who's a goddess uh, in the field? She's at Yale. And uh, her group, based on previous studies that show that microRNA-223 was enriched in hemogenic ECs in the zebrafish, they... They identified this microRNA-223 as a negative regulator of murine hemogenic EC specification and um, EHT, or transition. And what they showed is that if you knock out microRNA-223, you get increased formation of these hemogenic ECs and their derivatives, the hematopoietic stem progenitor cells. Um, and they show that this mechanistically is associated with retinoic acid signaling, which makes sense as, as this group, as well as others, has shown that retinoic acid signaling is key to this process. Um, also, they show that loss of, of microRNA-223 leads to a myeloid bias in the hemogenic ECs and, and the, their derivatives, the stem progenitor cells, and that results in an increased proportion of myeloid cells throughout embryogenesis and postnatal life. And, and that's, I think, you know, while it, for me, the, the more exciting thing is identifying identifying a negative regulator candidate, and when you get rid of it, you get more hematopoietic stem cells. Just practically speaking, uh, the idea of knocking down micro microRNA two twenty three in a stem cell system uh, that has legs, but also the, all the targets uh, of two twenty three. Um, so it's a really uh, fertile ground, a reservoir of of uh, candidates that might be relevant to this process, um, but also that other part of it, you know, the practical end of it's really important, but that other part of it with the myeloid bias, I think is really interesting. And it raises questions as to one, whether or not this is really feasible and practical in a safe way. It, it, myeloid bias, is it a bad thing? Um, and secondary to that is that, you know, myeloid bias is something that that happens with an aging hematopoietic stem cell niches and, and with age and the elderly. Myeloid bias and skewing is a key indication of that kind of clonal hematopoiesis um and it's associated with like uh, this negative uh outcome just because these people are old and they get cancer but is myeloid bias inherently a bad thing um i don't know uh, but a lot here to unpack a, a really nice story in developmental cell we're really going with developmental cell the last few episodes Lo have loved this journal forever so excited to see they're putting in more stem cell stories they must be listening to us a room I guess so. And yeah, you're right. These last couple episodes have been a, a love letter to, to DevCell. I love this journal, man. It gives such amazing fundamental developmental biology studies. And uh, I've been reading it for a long time. So 
I'm going to keep on, you know, giving it a shout out as long as we can. Maybe cover a, a dev cell paper, an episode. We'll see if we can do that. But I am, I, I'm with you. I'm a big fan of the journal. But yeah, you know, microRNA biology. I'll be honest with you, it's something that kind of scares me. It's just it's these transcript, these transcripts are just floating around, inhibiting things. It's you know, it's just looking it up. How many microRNAs are there actually? There's two thousand, but then there's potentially other 200,000 transcripts that are uncharacterized that are just floating around being negative regulators. I just feel like it's this aspect of the genome in my mind, that's just not, it, it's definitely gotten a lot more love recently, but it's not that traditional 20,000 genes that we know and love. Um, it's just a whole other, it's not epigenome, but it's this whole other auxiliary genome data set that you have to take into consideration when you're thinking about regulating transcriptional function and, and genetic function. The other thing, I, and I, I want to make sure I caught this right, did you say that there this was initially identified in a zebrafish? And so there was a, this 223 was found in the zebrafish, and then they translated it into the mouse. And that that in itself is pretty astounding to me, that there's that conservation and function for that specific microRNA between fish and mammals. That That's as a developmental biologist and as somebody who has an interest in evo-devo evolutionary development studies, that's that's pretty astounding. Yeah. I mean, I, I was going to even throw in a caveat for all the haters out there that this is a mouse study. But I mean, that's the thing about hematopoiesis. It's so fundamentally conserved. I mean, zebrafish to mammals, that is a bit of a jump. And I don't think you can take that for granted, although it is a, a great, um, you know, a nice fertile ground for 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 candidate uh, discovery. Um, but yeah, amongst mammals, I mean, hematopoiesis is so conserved and looks so similar across the mammalian um, kingdom. Is it a kingdom? I should know that. Um, <laughs> that you know, I, I really think that this is real, and I, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing it. What micro RNA 223 the relevance in the human system, and I'm sure there's a lot of researchers that are, you know, chomping at the bit like me to get after it, although probably better poised to ask those questions. And I, I can imagine that we can see some micro RNA 223 stories coming out in the human system any day now. But I, I, I will say this, we still will never crack the code to the metapoetic stem cell room. It's just not going to happen. You're such a pessimist, man. Just like you say, we're never going to get going to get bona fide human gametes from fluoropotent stem cells. You're just don't be such a hater, Dalen. All right. All right. Anyways, moving on to our last roundup paper for this week. This is a another nature paper, um, pretty high profile, looking at cancer development, um, deterministic evolution and stringent selection during pre-neoplasia. And the reason this is being covered on our podcast, stem cell podcast, is that they actually use a really cool organoid system and human gastric organoids to uh, to really drive this study forward. This is coming from Stanford, Christina Curtis's group, also Calvin Quo is on this paper, Casper Carlson, the first author here. So we're talking about tumor initiation and the processes that are driving tumor initiation. And, you know, there's been a, a lot of work on this recently, but, and you would think there's been a lot of work on this particular gene that they focused on, P53, okay, that is one of the critical oncogenes, one of the bona fide, you know, master regulators of cancer progression, I guess, that have been studied forever. But here they're actually modeling uh, occult pre-neoplasia by biallelic inactivation of T53 using a CRISPR-Cas9 knockout model. And this is specific to, in the in the context of gastric cancer, okay? P53 elimination is pretty common early driver for gastric cancer. Who knew? I mean, it's, I guess it seems pretty common across different types of cancers, but the exciting part of this, like I mentioned, they modeled the progression of that oncogenesis using human gastric organoids, okay? So the causal relationships between this particular genetic lesion in P53 and the resulting phenotypes were established using experimental evolution of the uh, multiple clonally derived uh, cultures of these gastric organoids over, and I'm about to say a, a period of time that's just astounding to me, over two years, all right? It's a two-year process of examining how these organoids are diverging in terms of their development and their oncogenic processes. So shout out to that. I mean, uh, any sort of study that incorporates multiple years into their cell culture, into their organoid culture is, I mean, y'all are, are impressive, I got to say. I mean, I can't even do a differentiation process for more than a month. There are some folks who do differentiations for six months. So this kind of gives me the chills a little bit, gives me the hives, but I'm glad they're they're doing it. And uh, the payoff is obvious with this, obviously with the nature paper, right? 
So what did they see after their two-year culture? Their P53 loss actually elicited a progressive aneuploidy in their cultures, including copy number alterations, copy number variations, and different structural variants that are actually prevalent in gastric cancers. So it, it's neat because you can artificially drive the oncogenesis of these gastric organoids in vitro and to you know, figure out these developmental maps that you would see in, in analogous fashion in vivo. So in other words, being able to predict the progression of the, the cancer phenotype using this in vitro culture. So they did a bunch of single cell analyses of these P53 deficient gastric organoids, again, showing a progression towards malignant transcriptional programs. And then a bunch of, I mean, a lot of cool tech in this particular paper. You got to check it out. High throughput lineage tracing with you know cellular barcoding, again, showing the dynamics of how these P53 organoids are shifting in terms of their, their progression. And ultimately, I think it's a, it's a nice way to study evolution of cancer in a dish driven by just a single mutation in this P53 gene. You think we have characterized P53 to hell. Like we've been studying this for so long now. But I think the reason why this got such a high profile paper that it did, in the, even though that they are looking at P53, one of the most frequently studied oncogenic genes out there, the tech. It's really about the tech here and all the different types of technology that they use to, to study this two-year progression of uh, P53 oncogenesis in vitro. You have the, the single-cell lineage tracing. You have the barcoding. Of course, you have the gastric organoids, which by themselves are, are tough to, to maintain and obtain. And so hopefully it's a, it's a nice data set that they've developed here for other folks who are studying oncogenic phenotypes and gastric cancer. So uh, really exciting story, really impressive in terms of how long they actually did the study. And I, I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I don't think I'm ever going to do cell culture for more than a year for, for a particular culture, but that's just me. Yeah, me neither. Um, yeah. To your point, I mean, P53 cancer, go figure. But uh, wow. it's the, uh, it's the, all the, the tech, right. And the, the effort and how it's laid out there. I mean, there, there's two kinds of papers, right? There's, well, there's a lot of kinds of papers, but within the context of the, this episode, there's the paper we started with, you know, the matters arising, which is robust, relatively short time scale experiment. Everyone's like, oh, I'm going to try that. And then who knows what happens. And then there's stories like this where everyone's like, oh, that took two years. You know what? I'll take your word for it. But I mean, the, the, the good news there is that you don't really need anyone to reproduce this. Right. And, th and this is kind of emblematic of the new data sets that we have and all the the transparency demands of the highest profile journals is like the data is out there it's it's all you don't really need to reproduce these experiments you can track the progress of all these two year cultures you know kind of effectively um just by uh, looking at that data and that data is what it is it's not something that's subject to any kind of interpretation uh, for the for the most part for a lot of it at least so I, like you, am a bit, you know, I'd say impressed would be the first word, but like a little bit bugged out and and, and it gives me anxiety, the idea of a, a group of people trying to maintain cultures for that long um, in any kind of ordered systematic way. Uh, but, you know, thank God for them because they did this. And although P53, you know, no one's going to be surprised. I think they're going to be really interested in seeing how this progresses because, of course, you know, we're talking about a multi-hit thing not only in the genes where P53 ultimately, you know, is usually one of them um, that you get loss of function in the context of cancer, but all the targets, right? All the, all the sequelae of, the, of a single transcription factor uh, or DNA repair. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's key, I think, to understand the, the molecular biology, not just the, 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 the genomics and transcripts. So a great story. Uh, I mean, these guys should go take a nap because they did it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with you. But I, I, the other part of it is I don't think they they did the two-year culture for nothing, right? Just, they didn't do it just to say that they did a two-year culture. Maybe part of it is, you know, when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, of course, they have that progression and that uh, development of their cancer over the course of multiple years. So it's theoretically possible that somebody with gastric cancer could be living with it for two plus years, you know, even up to a decade plus, who knows? So I think having these multi-year cultures could be predictive in that way. It's paralleling what's going on with the, the actual cancer, right? Absolutely.
And I mean, this was gastric organoids, but pre presumably this is fundamental. It's all cell types. So whatever your specialty is, get your two-year culture started because you're going to have to reproduce it in the lung organoid to see if it's real. Uh, <laughs> before we move on to our guest, Emma Rollins, I have a very special message from Stem Cell Technologies. Are you modeling the human airway in vitro? Are your cultures physiologically relevant? Can you generate these cultures consistently? Learn more about Numacult, offered by Stem Cell Technologies, a serum and bovine pituitary extract free cell culture media for human airway epithelial cells. Expand these cells for extended passages while maintaining air liquid interface differentiation potential to study respiratory biology, infections, and drug responses. Explore more at www.stemcell.com slash pneumocult. All right, everybody, with us today from across the pond, we have Dr. Emma Rollins, who is senior group leader at the Gurdon Institute in the Department of Physiology, Development, and Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Rollins' lab applies mouse genetics, live imaging, single cell molecular analysis, and mathematical modeling to understand lung stem cells. The long-term aim there is to direct endogenous lung stem cells to repair or regenerate diseased tissue. Emma, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's great to be there. Thank you. Well, the pleasure really is ours. Uh, why don't we start by having you elaborate on that brief overview I gave of your lab's research focus by giving us your own summary of what you do there. Happy to. Um, I don't know quite where you got that from, maybe my website. And maybe that's a little bit over the top. We collaborate with clever people, for example, if you do mathematical modeling. We're not doing it ourselves. But my lab focuses on lung stem cells, particularly in development and regeneration. We're interested in how you build a lung and then how you maintain it, particularly in the face of various different insults. For many years, we worked on mouse lung development and mouse lung stem cells. More recently, that's taken a bit of a back seat. We still do some mouse work but we're focusing much more on questions regarding human lung development and human lung regeneration. Great. I mean, it's a, it's a broad area to cover. And another part of what you Fear Lab has been shifting towards these days is using these next generation model systems like lung organoids. And these are these human fetal derived organoids and, and humanized mouse lungs as well to study the cellular and molecular mechanisms of human lung development. You actually had this really cool cell stem cell paper earlier this year using uh, these fetal lung organoids to model alveolar development. So tell us about the power of these new next generation model systems like these lung organoids for, for studying development and what do they allow you to do that you haven't been able to do before? Okay, well, thank you for the compliments on the paper. We're very attached to that cell stem cell paper. I think it's an awful lot of work my postdoc can take. Um, so the organoids are great because they allow us to study human lung cells and human cell molecular mechanisms. So what's nice about the work that Kung Tae did in that cell stem cell paper is that he actually combined the organoids we established, actually he established, with um, different mesenchymal cells in order to look at cell-cell interactions in the context of human lung development. So the key thing about the fetal derived organoids is that we know the cells that they come from. We know exactly what cells we're handling with. We've not had to differentiate them from an IPS cell, for example. And we can study human molecular mechanisms and human cells, which is subtly different to us. I've really come to the conclusion if we want to make a different human disease, we've got to work out those nitty gritty human mechanisms. Yeah, for, for decades now, I think we've been trumpeting the amazing potential of pluripotent stem cells to revolutionize regenerative medicine. Uh, and some of this promise is finally coming to the clinic. It's really an exciting time. Uh, but the principles of regenerative medicine have been built out largely on the back of adult stem cells, most notably hematopoietic stem cells, right? Um, I know you work with the endogenous cells in the lung, as you said there, you don't have to differentiate them. Uh, do, do you see regenerative approaches that tap into these uh, endogenous cells and their regenerative potential, specifically in the lung, as being the most practical and or the earliest entry point for regenerative lung therapies? Uh, are there limitations there that could only be overcome using pluripotent stem cells? Can you just share with us your thoughts there? Yeah, great questions. There's limitations to all approaches, is the first thing to say. For our approaches, 
and the pluripotent stem cell approaches, and they're always going to be complementary. So what I primarily work with in my lab is a fetal progenitor population that's actually multipotent for all epithelial cells in the lung. So our, my big vision, really, is that we could re-instigate fetal programs temporarily in the adult to initiate regeneration. So not necessarily using themselves themselves. We don't think we're going to be transplanting ourselves. Um, but we do want to be able to treat the molecular mechanisms that we know our cells are using. And I think this is really attractive, maybe pie in the sky, but I think you have to aim big. What's really attractive about this time idea is that fetal development is self-limiting. So we could transiently initiate a self-limiting process and rebuild a section of the lung from its endogenous stem cells. This is my vision. But actually, complementarily, there's lots of people working on differentiating IPS cells to fetal lung progenitors or to different airway cells and introducing those. And I don't think we want to give up on either approach just yet. Both have potential and excitement. Yeah, speaking of uh, fetal tissue, I mean, this reminds me of the days when we were generating pluripotent cells from discarded uh, human blastocysts, really polarizing, controversial, limited resource, but critically important um, for furthering research, as you said, kind of bridging the gap there. Uh, tell us about how, how do you go about that in a way that, um, you know, how do you get it done? Uh, how do you get the tissue and how important is it to, to communicate exactly with the public, exactly what you're doing um, in order to, to get across uh, the message and to get through these regulatory bodies? Yes, yeah, so the first thing to say here is I'm working in the UK where this is permitted. We can work with fetal tissue in the regulations. There's obviously it's a very tight control of this. And actually I can access a tissue bank that's funded by the UK's Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust. And that tissue bank goes into abortion clinics and consents people who are undergoing terminations to ask whether they would like to invest, um, to donate some of that tissue for research. So I'm one step removed from all of that, which I think is very important. The scientist shouldn't be the person knocking on the door for consent. We can tap into the source of consent to tissue, which is rare and precious, and then derive organoids and different cells that we're interested in from that. So I think the big advantage of doing that work is that we work in the primary tissue, we can bridge the IPS work, which I think for the long term will be the way to go. But for the moment, we need to do a lot more development of biology to bridge that and do that properly. Um, so we're doing that in the UK. We have, as I said, very strict regulations. Obviously, consent is a big part of that. But another big part of that is actually tracking the tissue and what we do with the tissue. And there's very strict regulations enforced by our Human Tissue Act that we are very, very careful to obey. And the university does a very good job of checking that we obey. So we're working in an existing regulatory framework, which is permissive for this. We like to think that we're not complacent. Um, we're aware that it's really important to be open with the public about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I'm part of a initiative in the, well, um, in the UK called the Human Development Biology Initiative. This is a multi-centre research programme on pioneering um, techniques for working with human fetal material in the lung, in the brain, in the blood, in many organs. And as part of that, we also run a very really big public engagement programme to discuss our work with the public. So we've just recorded our own podcasts, which are invasible wherever you get your favourite podcasts. Um, HDBI. Oh, and the name has just gone. <laughs> we had to change the name. <laughs> 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 the name is completely gone. Made the same way. Made the same way. It says eight projects and eight podcasts about our project and why we're doing this work. We have a public dialogue program about using human embryos in research, which is initiated in the summer. And we also have various other institute-led projects, again, to have that two-way discussion with the public so people know what we're doing, be informed about what we're doing. Of course, if they want to, can discuss what we're doing with regulators. Yeah, it's a critically important mission. I think, you know, we're doing parallel work here and trying to disseminate science to the greater public and relaying the importance of the science that we do to the greater public. And you mentioned the UK Biobank. That is that is an unparalleled resource. And honestly, I'm quite jealous. <laughs> I wish we had something comparable to that here in the States, but it's just a tremendous data set. And speaking of data sets, you know, one other major technology that's contributed to a lot of these emerging data sets is, of course, single cell RNA sequencing. You hear 
about all of these single cell atlas data sets that have come out there. And in fact, you're actually part of the human cell atlas project, folks. The long portion, of course, you actually had this really cool cell paper come out late last year that further developed this fetal lung cell atlas that actually uncovers these proximal distal gradients of differentiation and key regulators of epithelial fates during lung development. So tell us more about single cell and the power of single cell RNA sequencing That's how that's, and how it's a, allowed you to unlock new observations about human lung development and kind of take your studies to the next level. Tell us about that. Yeah, clearly that's really exciting. And um, we've been really lucky to be funded to do that work in collaboration with the Teichman Lab and Kirsten Meyer and John, Mar John Marioni's group. So we all know this now, that single cell biology is allowing us just to see what's there in a way we never could before. So what's, how many different cells are there in the lung? That's what we wanted to know. Where are they? What sort of transcriptome do they have? And then potentially how they talk into each other. Or what can we learn from this data about functional human biology? So we really enjoy being part of that project. I think we have a very, very, very minor role in the overall human cell atlas project, just working on this embryonic and fetal material. But it's been tremendous fun to see the project and really the scope of it, just how many different individuals they're profiling, how many different tissues, how many different cell types. So we really enjoyed working with um, Pong He, who's a bioinformatician working with us. Um, and I think the way I think about this data now, and it's a massive, massive data set, particularly for the lung, is that it's a tremendous hypothesis generation tool. But now we've got to bring all of our organoid and other models up to speed so that we can actually test those hypotheses in a more rigorous and careful way. Yeah, one of the amazing things about the single cell studies for me is the novel cell types they elucidate. Here we are at this stage in our understanding of, you know, developmental biology using models and, of course, human tissues limited. But still, I think it's pretty impressive that every one of these studies seems like you got a new cell, your own paper, as well as a paper from Ed Morrissey's group at UPenn about a year ago or more identify these novel progenitors, other papers too, I've done these novel progenitors in the human lung and uh, other novel progenitors and in intermediate states are being identified and other diverse organ systems. Um, we also talked recently on the show about these maladaptive clonal progenitors in the lung that emerge in the context of diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, so it, it occurs to me, is a therapy just, you know, thought experiment. Does a therapy that harnesses the regenerative potential of a, you know, a positive acting progenitor in, in the lung also pose a risk of mobilizing maladaptive uh, progenitors in the lung? Is that something that we need to wrestle with in terms of mobilizing endogenous adult stem cells in the lung, that there may be some kind of bad actors in there that you could also grow up? I think the answer is yes and no, because those maladaptive lung stem cells we're all very excited about in disease are actually part of a normal regeneration process. And there's very beautiful work from many labs now, from my colleague Juhan Lee in Cambridge, from um, Tata at Duke, showing that you get transit the activation of these cells that are then resolved, but possibly inflammation in cancer or in COPD actually retains them and then traps them in this um, chronic regenerative state, leading, partly leading to the disease. So yes, it is a worry, but if then we could tip them back into their regenerative state, into their normal biology, then quite possibly we'd be storing that tissue. So in some ways, I'm not too worried about that. I'm hoping we can naturally do the job or finish the job that nature started and push them back to a, um, a restorative homeostatic, homeostatic state. Quick follow-up. The, the, the similar idea, a few episodes back, we talked to Shannon McKinney-Friedman. And we're talking about the blood and she introduced this idea that I think has been kicked around that in these disease states, uh, you have like sickle cell anemia, for instance, you have these patients who have like a chronic inflammatory environment. And then when you gene engineer their own endogenous stem cells and put them back corrected, they've been so, so many generations of this inflammatory stress that then they're, you know, vulnerable to other types of uh, kind of, you know, pathology. Do you think a, a same kind of question in the lung, in the context of disease, when you're tapping the endogenous cell source, you know, just as an alternative 
to a, a pluripotent cell where you have a, a brand new cell, so to speak. Do you think you need to account for that kind of lifetime of inflammatory stress in treating these diseases? What do you think about that? I think it's a really great question. And almost certainly, and I'm not an inflammatory biologist, I'm not going to claim to be, but I think the most exciting thing that people are doing at the moment, um, I think in the IPF field, is not working on these maladaptive progenitors information, is actually working on our early diagnosis. So if we can get these patients much earlier, then I think regenerative therapies stand a chance. And that's where my hopes are. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, speaking of inflammatory biology, I mean, there's, of course, this pandemic that was happening recently, and uh, inflammation in the lung was a big problem in the case of COVID-19, right? And as a lung biologist, no doubt you had quite a spotlight during the COVID-19 pandemic with the the lungs, of course, being a major target site of infection and proliferation for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I mean, it's hard to believe that the pandemic started just over three years ago. It feels like a, a lifetime ago for me, honestly. So tell us about how your lab's work shifted during the pandemic and how you're able to adapt some of these technologies that we're talking about here today to actually better study COVID and its infection mechanisms in the lung? Peacefully, we didn't adapt and we didn't study COVID. Um, I had two small children at home. I did homeschool. <laughs> the institute was closed <laughs> and we did a small amount of work that was related to COVID, letting people have our single cell data, but we didn't work on ourselves. And to be honest, we didn't have the capacity. <laughs> so plenty of the lung labs did amazing work, but I'm afraid we didn't join them. But for sure, you're living in the, in a landscape that's been permanently altered. I think you know the scientific landscape, the funding landscape. Uh, here in the U.S., the COVID-19 public health emergency has just officially ended. Uh, on the ground, that translates to the relaxation of a number of protective requirements. A lot of detailed minutia related to like insurance coverage for testing and care. A lot of details there. But but the lasting impression on scientific research, I think, remains to be seen. But I, I don't think there's any debate that it's been altered, right? Um, it's a different landscape. And I think there's already a mounting backlash related to the exorbitant funding that was allocated for development of vaccines and therapies. That's interesting. I worry about an idea that funding for vaccines could be considered exorbitant. I'm very happy to have been vaccinated. <laughs> It's amazing, but you know, I think while I've been thinking that we should all be taking a victory lap, and I would have predicted that science would be, you know, reaping the glory of the triumph of vaccination for COVID. I think there's a, a growing uh, chorus out there suggesting that it was unnecessary. We should have let it rip. So th I think there's a lot of debate and more to come for sure, because there's a lot of problems emerging in the economy and climate, etc. Um, but you know. The pandemic is officially over, I guess you could say, but there's this shadow of another pandemic in our future. As someone who's worked in the lung, um, works in the lung, and I think is is really well positioned to maybe respond uh, or prepare, how do you think we should be preparing from a research funding standpoint? Where should we be putting our money in order to prepare for what many say is inevitable uh, second round, perhaps even more deadly. God fear. I'd strongly suggest that adaptive vaccine design <laughs> is where a lot of the money should be going. Because um, we don't want to be rebuilding people's lungs. We want to be stopping them getting damaged in the first place. Hmm. So I would love it if we invested more in science and invested more in stopping the transmission of these diseases. And actually, people like me could then focus regenerative medicine on the chronic diseases rather than trying to regenerate someone's lungs after they've been completely trashed by a disease like COVID. What's your take there on the, you know, some might say long COVID is a chronic disease that manifests sometimes in the lung. Do you think that that is a, a field of research that should continue to grow? I mean, or do you think that, I mean, in your experience, do you think that the long COVID in the lung is something that's manifested and is a growing problem? Or do you think that that's maybe receded a bit? I have no direct experience with this whatsoever. I'm not a physician. <laughs> okay. So I can't, really can't comment on that. Fair enough. Fair enough. I know what's reported in the newspapers and in nature, but... <laughs> 
No, fair enough answer. So let's talk about something that you are familiar with, which is, of course, your training path as a PhD scientist, right? right? You started off with your PhD at the University of Edinburgh and then ventured across the ocean to actually a school that both Dale and I went to as undergrads, Duke University, yeah. Go Blue Devils, uh, to work with none other than Bridget Hogan, who's a long and developmental biologist extra extraordinaire, before actually starting your own group at the University of Cambridge. And I was actually reading a previous interview with yours with the journal Development, where you mentioned that back in the day, it was commonplace for British scientists to travel to the U.S. for PhD and postdoctoral training, but not really the case anymore since there's obviously so many amazing research institutions around the world now for scientists to to travel to and train at. So what do you think, you know, inspired those jumps back and forth across the Atlantic? And tell us more just in general about your training path and the also the advice that you give your own students about where they want to train, where they should train, and who they should train with. So I never had any big plan and the advice I give my own students is to follow follow their heart really I think unless we really love what we're doing we'll never succeed this is a difficult job and we have to come with a lot of rejections a lot of disappointments so I did a PhD because I loved the software biology because I loved the software genetics and then I wanted to change so I found Bridget Hogan so I could learn some mouse genetics and then she persuaded me that I really should be looking for an independent PhD position probably wouldn't have done it without that bit of a kick. Um, and then we're still here because I love it so much, because I love sitting, talking to my students about the science, discussing details with my postdocs. So the advice I give to others is do what you love, look around, don't just look at the lung, don't just look at my own research, and go to a big meeting, see what excites you. And then in terms of choosing a lab, it's really about the personalities and the people and who you're going to get on working with, and who you're going to get good training from, not about where they are, not anymore. Times have changed. When I was a PhD student, we were told by our funders, you have to go to the States and do a postdoc, or you'll never be funded um, at a senior level. Hmm. But times have definitely moved on. Well, the takeaway for me there, you know, everyone says do what you love, but it never occurred to me, you got to like keep doing what you love and keep looking for what you love. You know, you can shift yeah. gears in your career and find new love. I mean, I wouldn't suggest it in a marriage. Try and stay, stay with the one you love in that case. But in science, be promiscuous. Don't tell my husband. My first love is developmental biology. Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> I doubt he listens to this anyway. Let's be honest. <laughs> But um, plenty others have listened and uh, love what you've shared. I, I, one of them, Arun, I'm sure I speak for him, but um, we really appreciate you coming by the show and sharing your thoughts with us. Before we let you off the hook, though, we got a, a couple of science peripheral questions. The first one, what is one hobby that you always wanted to pursue, but were never able to? You know, it's a bit bizarre, but I always wanted to be a patchwork quilter. I always think these beautiful things that people create or the colors are amazing, but they require a serious investment of time that I don't have. <laughs> this coming from the person who has spent a career doing the most laborious experiments. Don't have the time. Oh, please. Patchwork quilter you should have been. Do what you love, Emma. Oh, my goodness. In <laughs> retirement, I'm expecting a patchwork quilt to be produced. With mouse lens on it. Oh, Definitely. even better. Share that, please. Put that on the on the tweet. That one. Uh, next, fill in the blanks. When I am not conducting research, I am in the garden digging. The garden, of course. What do you got going right now? What's the season? Um, it's spring, and we're just planting lettuces, pulling out all the bindweed, generally clearing up. Spring is glorious. In New York, you love it. Everything's so electric green for about five minutes, and then it's disgusting and all covered in soot. It's a million degrees. Next, if I could have one superpower, it would be? The ability to sleep whenever I wanted to. Oh, wouldn't that be so great? I have awesome. the same thing. Sleep like five minutes at a time, but I'd be so much more productive. Yeah, or sleep on a plane or sleep anywhere. Or sleep at night in my bed. At that would be good too. <laughs> That's what I have trouble with. Um, finally, I can't start the day without a very large cup of tea. Hmm. Not the first, won't be the last person from uh, the UK who told us they start the day with a cup of tea. I mean, you're quite a cliche, Dr. Rollins, but we will oh, totally. accept to the yeah, end. I'll own it. It's fine. <laughs> well, 
go have another cup of tea. It's the end of day, but don't you guys bang out like 10 or 11 over the course? I'm going to have a cup of tea as, as you know, as an homage to this chat. It was a, a real joy for the both of us and all our listeners. Thank you again so much for sharing. Thank you very much for having me. All right, everybody, that brings us to the end of this episode. We'll be at ISSCR tomorrow. Looking to see you there. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. The next thing you hear will be us spouting off about all the fun science at ISSCR, but we'll also have regular scheduled episodes coming up. Until you next hear from us, thank you so much for listening.